Take this evening, one of the world's great entertainers and musicians, John Lennon of the Beatles, was shot outside his Apparently, Ted, it corner. happened around 10 so o'clock this evening. John Lennon and his wife, Yoko Ono, I'm told we're returning from a recording session or somewhere else in a limousine, got out of the limousine to their apartment at the Dakota, where they were shot by a man who has been described as a person who has a range or a coup or something like that. Immediately, John Lennon was brought right here to Roosevelt Hospital. This is only about 13 minutes away from his apartment, so it was not, didn't take too long to get him here. According to Dr. Stephen Loon, who's the director of emergency room services here, he just gave us a briefing. He said that Lennon was brought here this evening. The sun rises over Central Park. The 40-year-old John Lennon gets out of bed and puts on his black kimono, and his wife Yoko sleeps. Both are riding high after five years of the public eye. Their new album, Double Fantasy, is on top of the charts, but they are also busy with the promotion and recording of new material. It's one of the warmest days of the season, but John and Yoko don't have time to fully enjoy it. They have a full day of work ahead of them, including a photo shoot and a radio interview. Meanwhile, 20 streets away from them, at the Sheraton Center on 7th Avenue, Mark David Chapman is also contemplating his day. He flew into the city two days earlier, intending to kill John Lennon over the weekend, and spent hours outside the Dakota building where John and Yoko lived. John and Yoko left the Dakota and had breakfast at the Cafe La Fortuna on East 71st Avenue. John ate eggs and followed with a cappuccino and a guitar cigarette then decided to get a haircut because he had a photo shoot scheduled for the Rolling Stone magazine by photographer Annie Leibovitz. John is excited to be working again. He tells Annie that he has the idea for the magazine shoot. He tells her that he knows that the publication will probably just want Lennon on the cover, but he's hopeful that they will include Yoko. He tells his idea for the cover. John wants to be photographed naked, clinging to a clothed Yoko Ono. Leibovitz has no problem with that, and the photographs are taken. The image turns out to be one of the most iconic, and would be the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, just a few weeks later. The San Francisco radio producer Dave Sholin arrives to do what would become John Lennon's last interview. During the three-hour session, John began reflecting on the recent celebration of his 40th birthday and encroaching middle age. I hope I die before Yoko, he said, because if Yoko died, I wouldn't know how to survive. I couldn't carry on. We are either going to live or we are going to die. I consider that my work won't be finished until I'm dead and buried, and I hope that's a long, long time. When the Lennons stepped onto the sidewalk along West 72nd Street, the area around the entrance to the Dakota was unusually vacant. Where are my fans? John asked. At that point, amateur photographer Paul Goresh walked up to show John the proofs from a recent visit he had made. As John scanned the photos, another fan walked up, sheepishly extending a copy of Double Fantasy and a pen in his direction. Do you want me to sign that? John writes, John Lennon, 1980. His name was 25-year-old Mark David Chapman. In his coat pocket, he has a Charter Arms 38 caliber revolver. After signing the record, John hands it back to him, looks the boy in the eyes and asks, Is that what you want? Chapman doesn't answer, and Lennon gets into his car. As the car pulled away, Goresh saw John wave goodbye to him. Seizing the moment as their driver navigated the snarling midtown traffic, Sholin resumed their conversation, asking John about his current relationship with Paul. For his part, John didn't miss a beat, telling Sholin that their rift had been overblown, and that Paul was like a brother. I love him. Families, we certainly have our ups and downs and our quarrels, but at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, I would do anything for him, and I think he would do anything for me. John and Yoko spent four and a half hours working at the record plant. They are finishing a song called Walking on Thin Ice, which will be a single for Yoko. Faced with optimism, Lennon says to her, You just recorded your first number one. During the session, David Geffen, head of the label, visited the couple in the recording studio to tell them that their double fantasy album had just gone gold record. Lennon left the studio a happy man, probably as happy as he'd been in years. John made arrangements to return at 9 in the morning the next day, saying goodbye to producer Jack Douglas with a smile. On leaving the studio, Yoko asked John to go to dinner together, but John insisted on going to say goodnight to Sean. 
His limousine takes him down 8th Avenue to Columbus Circle, continues north on Central Park West, and then left on 72nd Street. Chapman is still loitering in front of the Dakota, where he struck up a conversation with the doorman. There is a vehicle parked in front of the Dakota entrance, so the limo doesn't enter the building and pulls up just ahead of the door. Yoko gets out, followed by John holding a tape recorder and cassettes. John looks at Chapman as he passes. Chapman says, Mr. Lennon? And as John starts to turn, Chapman shoots him. The first two hit John in the back, spinning him around immediately, while two more hit him in the shoulder and a fifth misses, each bullet passing through his body and the last crashing into the building. Lennon stumbles down the five steps of the building's office. The security man was reading a magazine, but when he sees John fall, he immediately presses the alarm button under the desk and calls the police. Yoko rushes to back up her husband and shouts for a doctor. Outside, Chapman takes off his coat so the police can see he is not armed. But Chapman does little to escape either. Within two minutes, the street is full of police cars. Chapman in seconds is handcuffed. Two officers lift the musician onto their shoulders and place him in the back of their patrol car. One remembers hearing John's bones creak as they lifted him. The police sirens go on and they immediately head to St. Luke Roosevelt's hospital, just a few blocks from the Lennon home. When John arrived at the emergency room, he had lost almost 80% of his blood. He has no pulse. Dr. Stephen Lin, director of the emergency room, returned to the hospital immediately after finishing his shift. Doctors do an emergency thorectomy. The surgery is an opening in the side of the body to access various organs such as the lungs or heart. One of the most advanced protocols of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Lennon has made an incision in the left chest and the ribs are separated, where they found a large amount of blood. They discovered that the main blood vessels leaving the heart were simply destroyed. I literally held his heart in my hand and pumped said the main doctor. But every time I pumped, most of what I did came out of all the blood holes. It was totally ineffective. Although seven doctors had tried desperately to revive him, John finally died. I have very bad news, says the doctor to Yoko Ono. Despite all our efforts to save your husband, we couldn't, and he died. Yoko was devastated. On ABC News, while Monday Night Football was happening, Howard Coos, he announces John Lennon's death to the world. Remember, this is just a football game. No matter who wins or loses, an unspeakable tragedy confirmed to us by ABC News in New York City, John Lennon, outside of his apartment building on the west side of New York City, the most famous, perhaps, of all the Beatles, shot twice in the back, rushed to Roosevelt Hospital, dead, on arrival. John was taken in a body bag from the morgue to Frank E. Campbell Funeral Chapel at Madison and 81st Street. From there, he went to Ferncliff Mortuary in Hartsdale for a cremation. Lennon was extremely fearful of the practice of cremation. And despite this, Yoko chose to burn the beetle. I'm sure she was aware of his feelings because he had once wrote against the practice in a song. According to the documentary, The Real John Lennon, none of his family in England were consulted about what to do with his remains. In fact, in his will, only his son Sean is mentioned. Nothing is said about Julian. Meanwhile, Chapman was charged with second degree murder of Lennon as premeditation in New York State was not sufficient to warrant charge of first-degree murder. Despite advice by his lawyers to plead insanity, Chapman pleaded guilty to murdering Lennon, saying that his guilty plea was the will of God. Under the terms of his guilty plea, he was sentenced to 20 years to life with eligibility for parole in 2000. Before his sentencing, he was given the opportunity to address the court, at which point he read a passage from The Catcher in the Rye. As of September 2022, he has been denied parole 12 times and remains incarcerated at Greenhaven Correctional Facility. Well, I suppose they tried to kill John. But they couldn't because his message is still alive.